I'm here to tell you about a friend of mine, but I want to make it clear that I don't claim too much for myself. Until a few days ago, John Graves wouldn't have known me from a hundred of his countrymen he passed along the trail. But he's still a friend of mine, for I've ridden down the river in his canoe sitting next to his dog passenger. I've listened to him ruminate about septic tanks, goats, tobacco, and the virtues and vices of hard scrabble farming. I've spent much quality time with John Graves because he's the kind of writer beside you who speaks with a clear personal voice so that when you're through with the book, you know you've met a man, a man who knows the light and the dark of his world and a writer who helps you to see the grays of it too. You know that when he writes of his world, he's been there. And it's true that he's traveled around the world a few times. Born in Fort Worth on August 6, 1920, he explored the Trinity River bottom before it came, became layered with Coors cans. He studied at Rice University in Houston with George Williams, who would also teach William Goyen and Larry McMurtry. He graduated in 1942 with Phi Beta Kappa, with Phi Beta Kappa honors. Like the others of his generation, he went to war and served as a first lieutenant in the Marines and was wounded at Saipan. After the war, he received a master's degree from Columbia in 1948. He then taught for a couple of years a few miles up the road at the University of Texas, but the wanderlust got him and he traveled around to France and Spain where he lived for a while to Tenerife in the Canary Islands and then to Mexico before he came back to his blood's country in 1957 and joined the faculty at TCU. After taking a canoe trip down the Brazos River in the fall of 1957, Graves wrote Goodbye to a River, published in 1960, and in that year bought the first part of his land near Glenrose. Working that land led to his book about it, Hard Scrabble, published in 1974. His third book, Notes from a Limestone Ledge, continues his ruminations on his home place and includes essays written over a period of time for Texas Monthly Magazine. Besides these three major books, John Graves has written on conservation for the Sierra Club and the Water Hustlers, 1971, and he has published a number of other works, short stories and articles for The Atlantic, American Heritage, Esquire, and The New Yorker. Through all of his writing, John Graves demonstrates how a writer with a clear sense of purpose, a respect for the bounty for a world, an understanding of the depth of simplicity, and a strong grip on language can step forth and move people in ways that last. I've always been struck by the subtle persuasion of goodbye to a river. It's the same rhetorical stance that Shakespeare's Mark Antony takes in his famous eulogy for Caesar, saying that he comes just to bury Caesar and not to praise him, and then he sets about to move his audience in his subtle praise. That's what John Graves does with his piece of the Brazos, and it is profound persuasion. It's the work of a masterful writer who has now attained the unofficial rank of the Dean of Texas Letters. I give you John Graves. I have a rather firm belief that writers ought to be read and not seen. <laughs> Last week, when I was visiting the collection for the first time, I was privileged to do some browsing among documents there, being an inveterate browser of that sort. And one paper that seized my attention was a letter sent to a Texas professor in 1926 by Andy Adams, author of The Log of a Cowboy. Because something the old trail writer said in it made him seem like my blood brother. Writing from his home in Colorado, after some comments about the cattle brands decorating the newly built Garrison Hall at the University of Texas, Adams concluded with this statement. I, w <clears throat> I was invited to attend the dedication hall, but was afraid someone might expect me to make a speech, and I would rather be shot at at the distance of 10 steps than to face an audience. <laughs> Such skittishness about public appearances and public utterance is not too uncommon a quirk among cowboys, writers, and other unsocial types. <laughs> I confess to sharing it in full. In fact, having now reached a relatively austere age when 
stubborn eccentricity is tolerated a bit better than it is in younger men. I resolved a couple of years ago that henceforth I wasn't going to take on any more public speaking than I could possibly get out of. Yet here I stand before you, bouncing my voice off your eardrums, claiming, <coughs> laying claim to your attention. There are two or three good reasons abdication of principle on my part. <laughs> Chief among them, I guess, is my long-standing close friendship with a devilishly persuasive fellow named Bill Whitliff, <laughs> who is passionate about this collection and has been the prime moving spirit behind its establishment, as Dick and the others have already said. They've already said several things I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Another reason is that I myself believe strongly in the project and its purposes, and still another is that you who are listening to me have attested by the fact of your presence here on this day that you believe in the project too. In effect, we have a sort of family connection based on shared belief, and family <coughs> members are easier to talk to than strangers. Most of them are, isn't it? <laughs> During the time, or at least during the latter half of it that I've spent back at home in this region where I was born and reared, I've been aware of and have occasionally contributed to conversation, argument, oratory, and writing on the topic of Texas and Southwestern literature. True, this isn't a subject that the general population get highly, gets highly excited about, but it's one that I imagine has touched the interest of just about everyone in this audience. I have no intention of tackling here the large and oft-debated question of why and how this region continues to see itself as distinctive in an age that lurches toward sameness everywhere. But by and large, the region does thus view itself. And if this all too often leads to jingoism, <coughs> if this all too often leads to jingoism, prevention, narrow-mindedness, boastfulness, and other regrettable attitudes. It can also lead to more pleasant things, such as the, the, as the belief, or illusion, or conviction, or whatever it is, that we do have a literature of our own. For whatever Southwestern literature's virtues and lacks may be, whatever its degree of acceptance in the wider world of letters of America and the world, it is our literature insofar as we feel ourselves to be Texans and Southwesterners, just as the work of Shakespeare and Milton and Tolstoy and Faulkner and a host of others belongs to us as conscious inheritors of Western civilization. These bodies of writing that belong to us play a part in shaping us as people, at least they do if they deserve the name literature. Judged by this criterion, Texas and Southwestern branch of the world of letters has pretty much proven itself. Certainly it did so in terms of my own generation, for whom the work of the old frontier chroniclers and of Dobie, Webb, Betty Check, Catherine Ann Porter, and the rest has imbued our surroundings with resonance. These writers have heightened our awareness of the, south, of the Southwest land and people, woods, hills, mountains, prairies, deserts, the bays and islands along the Gulf Coast, vegetation, geological phenomena, beasts and birds, battles, Indian tribes, other historic matters, towns, accents, dialects, myths, livelihoods, skills, pastimes, attitudes, and local ways. Their books help us to sense the spirit and feel of our region and of our people past and present and thereby help us to know, in part, who and what we are ourselves. And the old books seem to have been doing the same thing for succeeding generations, even in the face of potent national and worldwide pressures toward conformity and the obliteration of regional myths and meanings. I'm not well enough versed in the current publishing scene to cite titles and numbers, but I'm aware that many of the more useful earlier books relating to the Southwest, which were quite hard to get hold of when I was younger, 
at about the time, for instance, that I was working on that river book. They're now in print again. And they, st and they stay in print because they're being bought and read. I would guess that a certain number of the folks who still look on our region and its culture as distinctive must feel an obligation to learn what these things consist of. I hope so. Without not the sense of distinctiveness is a shaky proposition in a time like ours. It's still growing, this body of expression, flavored and textured by the natural framework and history and social circumstances of our part of the world. It is bringing forth new viewpoints on the region's past and the remnants of that past. It is examining urban life in an urban time. 